get going. Uh, welcome to the Amherst Historical Commission public meeting on Wednesday, February 16th, 2022. My name is Jane Wald and as chair of the Amherst Historical Commission, I'm calling this meeting to order at 6.31 p.m. Pursuant to chapter 20 of the acts of 2021, this meeting is being conducted by remote means. As no in-person attendance is permitted, every effort is being made to ensure that public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. In addition, this meeting is being recorded and uh, minutes are being taken as usual. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so uh, in the following manner. Open the town's homepage on an internet browser, navigate to the town calendar at the bottom of that page, click on the historical commission meeting link. Zoom and telephone connections and the meeting agenda can be found there. So let's take uh, attendance by roll call. So board members, as you hear your name called, please answer affirmatively or raise your hand. Patricia Ah, Present. Catherine Davis. Present. Robin Fordham. Present. Becky Lockwood. Present. Janet Marquardt. Hetty Startup. Present. And Jane Wald, I'm present. Um, opportunity for public comment will be provided uh, during uh, a general public comment period um, listed on the agenda and at other appropriate times throughout the meeting. Um, please be aware that the commission uh, will take note of comments, but um, will not necessarily be able to respond to them during the public comment periods. Uh, please indicate you wish to make a comment by clicking the raised hand, raise hand button when public comment is solicited. If you join the Zoom meeting using a telephone, please indicate you wish to make a comment by pressing star nine on your telephone. When called on, please identify yourself by stating your full name and address and put yourself back into mute when finished speaking. Residents are welcome to express their views for up to three minutes and at the discretion of the commission chair. So let's see, first on our agenda is uh, to review and discuss the preservation plan uh, update and RFP, which we have gotten in the meeting packet. Uh, so we've had a chance to uh, comment and send um, Ben feedback. Um, and um, Ben, do you want to, do you want to comment on the, on the, on the RFP draft and sure, what, what yeah. next is needed? Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. I will. Um, so I guess just a little bit of background. There's uh, $25,000 that was allocated in, in, in uh, CPA funds. I think I don't know, back in 2018, 2019 maybe. Um, and it's for the purposes of, of updating the 2005 preservation plan. So um, fast forward to now and we're, you know, with COVID and everything put a, uh, put the brakes on a little bit, but now we're ready to uh, put together the RFP for the uh, preservation plan update. And, you know, I, I approached it as, you know, it, it, I'm thinking of it as an update to the plan, but it, it really, it should be a document that can kind of stand on its own and, and, you know, and, it, you know, it should be a, a, yeah, it should be a standalone document, its own plan, but it doesn't need to recreate the, the wheel per se, you know, it can build off of the 2005 plan. Um, and so I'm hoping there's a cost savings with that too, because they don't necessarily need to rewrite the history of Amherst section or the you know, history of, you know, the historical commission section and that, that level of detail. But, you know, I think the goals are to, uh, you know, do an inventory of what's been done, you know, do, you know, public outreach and stakeholder meetings to kind of gauge what the, uh, you know, goals are and, uh, you know, what, what's valued in town and what needs protecting and kind of what are the, what are the um, kind of like, yeah, preservation goals overall. And then, 
Secondly, is just identifying very actionable items that can guide the work of the historical commission and really the town in general for um, for the purposes of historic preservation. And I think um, I think Jane has brought this up in the past. Like the the previous plan um, was you know wonderful, but it 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 and it identified a lot of goals, but sometimes it was a little bit hard to like figure out like okay like literally like who do I need to contact at the state to like get this done like it, it was so we wanted to make sure like you know grants are identified like key people that we need to contact at the state or you know federal government or like are identified and there's very clear um you know implementation steps and you know so I think that, that was another goal for this um and I think we've talked about this before um, previous meetings. I think it's important um, for the town to also use this up as an opportunity to um, kind of just address and incorporate the history of um, underrepresented populations and minority populations uh, in the town historically. Mm -hmm. So, you know, going back all the way to Native American populations through the um, African American populations uh, through the town's history. So, um, I think the role of the preservation plan is to identify where are the gaps in the you know, quote history of Amherst as we know it now, and then what are actionable items to help uh, preserve and tell that history. Um, and so, yeah, that's what I tried to, um, it's, it, that's what I tried to incorporate into the uh, scope of work document. Um, it's a lot of it's pretty dry. It's like talk to this person, prepare this uh, <laughs> section here. But um, I think a lot of the uh, a lot of that also just gets translated, you know, transmitted to the consultant through conversations and, and meeting with them and talking about talking it through. Um, so that's kind of uh, the background. Um, I will say uh, the. In I guess just even in the past like few weeks um, since I posted the packet and everything, um, I've I've uh, I've talking to Nate and to uh, the planning director Chris Restrup. Um, we were thinking um, one option instead of uh, kind of putting this out to bid to the world, if you will, or to consultants. Um, around New England, um, we could also contract directly with the uh, Pioneer Valley Planning Commission, PVPC, mm -hmm. and um, that is often a, a much simpler option because um, we can contract with them directly it's through like an intergovernmental contract as opposed to um, a competitive bidding process, and um, so that saves us time in general, mm -hmm. but also, um, you know, we, we have full faith that uh, the planners at Pioneer Valley Planning Commission could do a superb job because of their, um, you know, they have uh, historic preservation planners there and um, and obviously just have done a lot of work with Amherst and surrounding communities and know kind of the landscape, if you will, of historic preservation in the state, what tools are available, what grants are available. Um, so that's so I feel like with the uh, with the uh, RFP I put together, the the scope of work is still really important because even if we go with PVPC, the scope of work is we want to make sure that we're all on the same page about that. Um, it's just I wouldn't necessarily need that uh, second section with qualifications and uh, submission requirements because it wouldn't really be a competitive bidding process. But I will assure you that uh, the PVPC. Uh, does meet the uh, requirements that I put um, on on there, so um, they are definitely qualified to do this work. So, and Shannon Shannon Walsh, is that right? She's the one who did our um, our outbuilding inventory, right? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So it would be Shannon Walsh would take a lead on it, and she's um, done a lot a fair amount of work for Amherst. Um, I also think that um, you know we've had a little conversation about, well, you said it earlier, Ben, that, um, you know, this would not be reinventing the wheel, but, you know, now on the other side of uh, cost escalations, yeah. you know, if this were a competitive bid, what, you know, there, there might be some, um, 
you know, concern about meeting that $25,000 mm-hmm. fee, but um, I think PVPC would, you know, we could have just a sort of a forthright conversation with them and they with us about, you know, how much that would cover. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah. your, your uh, call makes it look like an awfully lot of work, but in fact, it's all intrinsic. I mean, anybody who does this as a general rule is going to do all these steps and they all feed into each other. So it's not, you know, you've broken it down really beautifully, but it's not like each of these things is a separate project. They're going to be doing it all at once and, you know, updating and rewriting sections as they go. So it's, it, I don't see any reason why that wouldn't fit into a time frame for that budget. Mm-hmm. Looks pretty straightforward to me for people who do this. Yeah, I guess my, um, to Jane's point, my, uh, I, I did get a, in contact with some uh, communities in Eastern yeah. Massachusetts yeah. who have done uh, recent updates to their preservation plan. And um, that was like a year ago and uh, their cost estimates were like 30 to 35,000. Mm-hmm. Um, and I imagine, yeah, just with, I don't know, it seems like the price of everything is going up, so. Um, but were they wondered. starting from scratch? Yeah, so that's a good point. They were starting from scratch, um, but uh, you know, just you know, so it's a ballpark. But but I, I do think PVPC um, can offer you know uh, a competitive uh, can uh, can can get it done for twenty five thousand dollars. And okay. you know, if anything, it, it actually where we have said we have a good working relationship with you know, the planning commission there. So like, if they need to, um, you know, offload a bit of the work onto town staff, then that's easier to do if it's with PVPC as opposed to a, con- a private consultant. Um, Cause we work, just we just work well together. Um, um, so there may be sort of two questions here. One, you know, do we want to just go ahead with PVPC? Second, maybe is there any other comment uh, needed on the on the draft RFP, or or in this instance would be kind of scope of work. So, um, Robin, um, I wanted to say that I just wanted to underscore that one of the things that when this particular CPA award came up. Um, the diversity and equity focus in terms of history was something that I really um, spoke about and convinced a lot of people on the on the committee. So that's a um, I think that's great that we have that as a focus. Um, people couldn't understand why we needed to update it, and I uh, was able to explain to them that our impressions of history change over time. <laughs> um, and then the only thing I think in terms of substance that I, 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 Ben, I don't know if you saw, I sent it at last minute, but just some mostly, um, uh, you know, punctuation and changes kind of things. But the one substantive comment that I made was just around whether um, we needed to have an an most threatened focus, which um, some communities have, and, you know, would be an interesting thing for our committee to know what, you know, what's, what five items are, you know, we most at the risk of losing without forethought. That was just one, mm-hmm. one thought that I thought that we might include. That's good. That sounds like a good idea. Um, most threatened gets attention at different levels of government by different organizations. So that could work to our advantage. Um, if there was some other resource out there, we could tap for um, protecting right. what's threatened. That could be a really contentious list though, right? Everybody won't agree what is and what isn't. Well, I mean, I would just say that that's our, that, is that not our job to determine what are we here for? If yeah, unless we ask for community input. Uh, well, we can, you know, I mean, well, I, I haven't been at this long enough 
but I've been at it long enough to I think that say that you know we can ask for community input and take that in advisement and then make our, our recommendations. It's just, you know, it seems to be something that um, I mean it's what mass preservation does. It's you know, the idea is that you focus on the things that you could lose imminently. I mean, I don't think I think that's relative, their importance might be in question, but their threatened status. <laughs> Well, isn't it too part of this that this this group, uh, whoever we hire, will hold some public meetings and get some input? So that that would be certainly part of that, I would think. I think it would be. I think the key there is not to leave it too late, is to collect that opinion along with other information and then uh, and then evaluate it, uh, but not but evaluate it along with everything else. Mm -hmm. And I think you have one public meeting in there. Is that right? Yeah, I'm actually, I'm looking through it now. I think, uh, yeah, so it's outreach. Participate in one public meeting during the outreach okay. section. But then I think there's also a, um, yeah, there's a present the recommendations of the plan at a public forum towards the end of the process. Right. right. So they would get feedback when it's kind of in draft form for the full plan. And there's getting input from a variety of, well, from different categories of, uh, mm -hmm. in, in addition mm -hmm. to the public meeting. So, um, Robin, were you suggesting that we, we start with the list that the planning folks would, would start with? Uh, and bring to a public meeting or or no, I was suggesting a public the, meeting would generate it. I was suggesting that the um, consultant uh, provide recommendations for for threatened resources. Yeah, I mean it's definitely it makes uh it's a it's a compelling part of a plan. I, and you know, I often think of you know plans are great to help set um, direction and goals, but it's also always something that we reference back to when we're writing grants. And, you know, if we can say, you know, the X number, you know, some house is the, you know, third most threatened or identified as, you know, the third most threatened house in Amherst or something, um, or, you know, put a number to it, you know, it's that list that creates um, a compelling narrative, I guess. Well, and it gives a, it, it reinforces, uh, if I'm learning anything from my studies, it reinforces the notion that it's not an arbitrary decision. It's mm -hmm. something that is, mm -hmm. you know, ties it back to our mission and purpose. As a, and as a part group, of a strategic plan. Yeah. yeah. I'm sorry. As a group, we, we, um, uh, decided that we were going to participate with the local historic district to consider preservation of the houses on the, on the west side of North Pleasant Street. So, you know, th those are threatened for, with development and um, they're historic. And so, you know, I mean, I'm thinking in terms of lists like that, there may be one specific or two specific places, but there could be a, a, a neighborhood, a block that we would be concerned about. So that was why I was asking if we, if we should um, do a, a seed list and let the consultant go from there. Um, yeah, I don't know what other people's thoughts are. My thoughts are um, that it just be um, something that comes out, that the list itself be something that comes out of the plan process, but I'll leave it at that. Hetty? Um, I wonder if it would be possible to, once the plan has been revised, um, to take it to the village clusters that are referred to in the plan, um, mm -hmm. or even talking about underrepresented communities to somewhere like Hazel Avenue, which I have only just recently learned is really kind of important in terms of the African-American history of the town. Um, and I'm shocked at myself that I didn't know that before. I've been here um, a few years now. Um, you know that it's, it's sort of a, a an awareness thing um, 
maybe we could do some walks in neighborhoods and bring a stack of the plans or have some right. kind of right. online online uh, link that people could reference um, and just see who shows up. So in that would be post planning outreach. Sounds like you're talking about yeah, it. yeah, um, yeah. Becky? Isn't I think if I if I remember a part of this process is also to identify what kinds of public things we could do, um, which goes right along with what you said. Um, but I but I have another question. So the twenty five thousand figure. What happens if you go to um, the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission and they can't do it for that? I mean, do we know? Or I guess we'll just deal with it if that happens, right? Yeah, we could always modify the scope. Um, okay. Yeah, okay. but that's a good point. One of the things I was reading was all of the, the information where we've got incomplete sort of information addresses that's quite, quite lengthy, um, you know, that just needs checking and cross-referencing, you know, I, I don't know how important that kind of thing is, um, whether that should be prioritized in, in terms of how we talk to the people at the Pioneer Valley Planning Group. Um, that was just something I noticed, you know, mm -hmm. how, how, how current is, is the information in the plan um, in terms of it being a really useful resource for making decisions? Um, I'll make a comment about that, and that is, uh, we have a we we do have some work to do to tighten up the inventory of historic buildings and significant buildings. Um, I think a a goal for us or for the historical commission can eventually be to have that fairly complete inventory so that it can be used as a outreach and communications tool with homeowners and with potential pur purchasers uh, and to uh, implement as smoothly as possible the, the, the preservation bylaw. Um, if we can refer to, you know, we, we know what our historic structures are, we know what the criteria are, and that removes some of the subjectiveness of, of a, mm -hmm. you know, demolition, what now is demolition delay hearings. Um, that would be, a, I think that would be a neat goal. I'm not sure that can be comprehended under this, uh, <laughs> under this particular scope of work. Yeah. Um, oh, Ben, what do you need from us? Do you need, um, uh, I guess, um, or, uh, yeah, I guess just support for the idea of contracting directly with the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission and if there was any major red flags with the scope of work. Okay. Um, and I don't think that requires a, a vote. So we can uh, just give you a, a thumbs up or a thumbs down. And um, <laughs> if anybody has uh, anything to add uh, to to Robin's comments about uh, additions or amendments. Robin, perhaps you have one. <laughs> just, uh, I just wanted to clarify, I just looked it up on the document. It's to add that um, uh, most threatened to the project objectives, to add a number seven, I think it would be. Um, as a most tight and, and Ben, that's in my notes yeah. in the version. Yeah. Of so just to be clear, just to throw that. Okay, in. cool. Okay. Okay. So you've got a thumbs up from from me and Pat and, and Robin and Catherine and Becky and Jan. Okay. Oh, can I have one, one more comment, Jane? When was our last um, revision of the plan, Ben? Uh, the original plan was in 2005, 2005. Um, and, yeah. it, and it hasn't been revised. So can we, um, how do I say this? I think the general um, 
advice to, to revise, clearly not this deeply, every five years? Can we put that into our, I don't know, into our historical commission hat so that we have this on our timeline to not let it go. How many years has it been now? 16, 17? Not let it go 17 years. <laughs> um, you, you moved in my screen then. So that, yeah. Um, <laughs> that, that's my last comment. <laughs> I think it would be a lot easier to update it every five years because mm -hmm. it would yeah. be more incremental updates than is probably the case right now. Right. Yeah, I agree. <clears throat> All right, um, so next up is a, a, a policy on historic preservation restrictions. And um, so this is an, uh, just a nice uh, uh, account of what the issues are here. Um, so do you want to um, say any more about it? And then we can, maybe we can go to the questions. Sure. Yeah. So obviously this is kind of a new thing that um, has emerged recently, I guess, for the commission. Uh, according to Nate, this was a discussion topic maybe five to seven years ago, but there wasn't really any clarity. Um, so the what we are looking to do is to establish a, I guess in simplest terms, a new policy um, that kind of encompasses various different uh, elements of historic preservation restrictions. And just so we're all on the same page about historic preservation restrictions, um, you know, they're pretty similar to like a conservation restriction that you might put on a you know piece of conservation land or an agricultural preservation restriction that you put on farmland. It, a historic preservation restriction you put on a property or a building and it um, kind of locks that structure into looking uh, as it does today uh, in potential in perpetuity. So it's in a, it's a binding, you know, deed restricted legal agreement between the property owner. And in this case, it's the town and it's the historical commission acting on behalf of the town. So, um, so that's kind of what a historic preservation restriction is. And then, uh, there's numerous different ways they can be triggered. You know, a landowner could just donate a preservation restriction to the town if they were feeling philanthropic and wanted to, you know, preserve their home in perpetuity. But usually there's some sort of trigger and it has to do with, you know, receiving grant money. And so in this case, uh, uh, CPA money, which is Community Preservation Act, uh, is obviously public money that's allocated each year from the town to uh, you know for historic preservation, conservation, housing, and recreation. And so, within the uh, uh, I guess legislation for CPA, because it's a state program um, or state enabled program, there it's required that you know if the town acquires an interest uh, in in a property, then uh, that interest must be protected with a preservation restriction. And so I guess different towns, I don't know if the state purposely left it vague or not, but different each town, as far as I know, kind of interprets what it means to acquire an interest in a property. Um, you know, in the, in the most explicit sense, it means, you know, actually the town is actually buying the property and that's you know acquiring an interest in it. But for others, it's um, it's you know for for example with the Jones Library or for the J Jewish community of Amherst, the town gave uh, quite a bit of money to repair the building um, to to so it and you know for and for the sake of historic preservation. And so, um, so yeah, I guess we are trying to. Under, so, and then I guess the final point is that preparing a, a historic preservation restriction takes an incredible amount of work. 
Um, and it often falls to me or whoever's in my position as the staff liaison. Um, I don't know, maybe in other towns, they you know offload that work to consultants. I don't know how it's done, but it, it is a lot of work. It involves numerous uh, meetings with lawyers and from both groups and uh, numerous rounds of revisions uh, because the state historical commission has to approve it and they have very specific um, requests often for all the details. And so um, we uh, were interested in kind of establishing a threshold for, by, for, for when a permanent restriction is required, which needs to be approved by the state versus when a, um, a, a local restriction is required. And a local restriction can be for a maximum of 30 years and it doesn't require involvement from the state, um, which makes it a lot easier to implement. Um, and, um, you know, 30 years is, is the term limit for uh, by which the town can hold a, a restriction. So we would be going to the maximum for that. So uh, I guess that's a, that's a lot, but essentially we're trying to establish a threshold um, to determine when a permanent restriction is required versus a local restriction is required uh, for the payment of CTA funds. Um, and so, you know, there's numerous ways to do it. Nate and I talking, we, you know, we just, we had used a financial threshold, just, you know, the actual amount of the grant given to the applicant. So we said $100,000 could be a cutoff but it could also um, be based on the value of the house or value of the structure relative to the grant amount or um, you know, the relative importance of the uh, uh, repairs being made, if you will. So um, we just thought it was simpler to pick a nice round number and start there, but we are uh, definitely curious to, I think we want, obviously the historical commission to adopt this policy. So I, we, are, we want to know, kind of get some guidance from, from you all. I have um, a couple of just um, yeah. sort of framing questions and then Robin's got her hand up, but um, what do, do you have a, like a time frame for how you want to consider this and when, you know, when you want to adopt it? Um, that's a good question. Uh, not really. I think um, ideally, I guess maybe before the um, CTA funds are allocated for the latest round, which would be in July, I guess, um, could kind of just, it would be good. It would maybe just be cleaner to have, have a policy in place when the funds are allocated, but I'm not sure it really matters. Okay. Um, Robin. Hey there. So many questions. So I'm gonna try and just like really narrow in. The first question is, what does the CPA require? The second question is, and a lot of this is just really informed by the classes I'm taking. Yeah. Like here in Vermont, where I am right now, they don't recognize the term preservation restriction they have preservation easements and the easement is held by a third party and the third party is responsible year after year for affirming that the entity is mm -hmm. confirming conforming to the easement that they're not you know building on conservation <laughs> land or they're not um, altering the historical structure. So that's, those are, those are my questions. My, you know, I had, I had understood in a very vague sense that anybody who received CPA funding was required to have a, a preservation restriction. And, um, and then I guess my third question is, why is it so complicated in the Sarah McKee's letter and the, the issue with the easement of Jones Library is sort of like, I imagine that it should not take a decade or more. It should probably take what six to twelve months. <laughs> and why aren't we, 
you know, using CPA funds, administrative funds or something to outsource this to make it faster. So okay. yeah, there's, there's a whole bunch of stuff all at once. Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, so I guess just to, just to clarify, um, what we, we are, we're, it's always required to have a restriction in place when CPA funds are being okay. given out. It, we're just making the distinction between a local restriction and a permanent restriction. So um, I hope that maybe that was not clear in the, the policy statement. But the idea with that was that every, whether you get a dollar or a half a million dollars, you're gonna have a restriction in place. The question is whether it's a 30 year restriction that um, we just can handle internally and not involve the state or whether, or at what point do we need to make it a, a permanent in perpetuity restriction and bring the state Okay. and make the process much more complicated. <laughs> so I think the thing is like, for example, I always talk about the Goodwin Church where we gave them, I think 12 or $13,000. And is it worth me spending, you know, potentially a year to prepare the restriction and go back and forth with the state um, and make it a, 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 per a permanent restriction okay. or for for thirteen thousand dollars, can I get the restriction done quicker, and um, and just have it be a thirty year restriction? So. Uh -huh. um, okay. So, um, Catherine, did you have a, something you wanted to say? I'm I'm percolating, but thank you so much, Jane. I mm -hmm. I I'm, I'm listening to all of the things that Ben that you were saying, and I'm I have yeah future questions and or just statements to make. Um, yeah. Becky and then I guess um, my question is in, in determining the amounts of CPA funding, like you're gonna put a limit on it. Um, do we have, I am not sure how you chose those, I guess. I mean, I'm not questioning it, but um, do you have a sense of, how many how many properties involve over a hundred thousand CPA funding in three years? I guess that's my question. Do we know how many this is? Is it just a few? Um, just to kind of understand the scope of 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 what needs to be done. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it depends on the year. Um, okay. but I would say you know typically there might be one to two okay. projects below you know in, in the in the you know below like in like the twenty thousand dollar range and then so and then every every year where there's always a few really big projects that have six digits or more um i mean uh yeah Pat. my question is is ben if, if you set a dollar amount um, that makes sense be, as you just gave the example right. of the Goodwin Church. But if, if you put a, a preservation on it for 30 years, is, is, can that be renewed in 30 years locally? Oh. So it becomes in per, per, perpetuity, but, but with a less onerous uh, process. Um, so it can be... So I mean, yeah, there's always all these hypotheticals. Like if they if they apply for funds during that 30 year period, say in year 20, then I think it would just be extended another 30 years from 30 years. Um, from when they receive the funds each each time would be my guess. You know, and maybe that's part of the policy, not to get too nuanced, but like, you know, what if they apply for funds in year three of a 30 year restriction? Do we really have to go through the effort of extending it um, th three years on the other end, you know. Mm -hmm. um, Jan. I was thinking that the, that the dollar figure isn't a good measure, but I haven't come up with an alternative. Yeah. Because <laughs> um, yeah. if you think of, well, I was thinking of the house that, um, Bruce wrote about the, what's it called? Uh, the, North Amherst. Yeah, North Amherst Community Farm. 
you know, there's an example where they've come back every few years for more. And what would you do? Would you start it over? Would you have to do all the work again? Um, but I was also thinking how different kinds of buildings and different projects, just different um, amounts seem small or seem large depending on the project. So there's this barn, you know, that I have these friends that own uh, on the South Common. And we've looked into charges for stabilizing it, for roofing it, for replacing the windows not anything to do with restoration, just to keep it from further deterioration. And just the stabilization is 125,000. So if you put together a package of the most essential things to conserve it, and then say, and as property owner, I will then take it further. I'll, you know, repurpose the building or I'll, you know, paint it and do something with it. And you ask for something like 125, 150,000, that would trigger a permanent um, restriction. And you're talking about a barn. That's gonna take, I would think, an enormous amount of effort to get approved, right? Um, and I don't think, I can't imagine the state wanting to go over every barn, but those are that expensive. I mean, when Hampshire College came to talk to us about that one that's on the roundabout by Atkins, they were saying over 100,000 if they were just going to keep that barn in shape, right? And so I, I think those kinds of buildings, 100,000 is small change. That's why the number doesn't really feel like the right measure to me. Um, I, my comment about that uh, is, is that it's the nature, you know, the nature of the restriction is uh, comes into play here. Um, it's a permanent restriction doesn't need to be onerous. It can just be permanent or a permanent restriction can just trigger some kind of, you know, review when, when the owner wants to make changes. Um, so that's there. I think there's some, some latitude in there. On the other hand, um, what is kind of difficult and onerous is when the nature of the restriction, when there's too much latitude, you know, because if, if there's a whole lot of room for negotiation, then that's what, that's where all the time gets spent and it just spins and spins and spins. If an applicant understands what the nature or what you know, if there are certain options for restrictions that are already established, um, an applicant or an owner can understand that at the outset um, and, and be able to determine whether that's a good, whether CPA funding is gonna be a good fit. Um, I, I, that might sound a little bit vague, but I, I think I'm interested in, in sort of digging in a little bit into, you know, what the nature of the restriction should be. I think we're not quite there yet in our, in our conversation. So um, I did see Robin's hand and was there another one? Catherine, Catherine, Catherine. go ahead. Cause I'm trying to formulate my thoughts. Well, I'm, I'm actually okay for now. I, one of the questions I wanted to follow up and sort of just a dialogue with Jan and then bringing Ben is some of the things that and you were saying we will hopefully get to later in our conversation. I also don't think the dollar amount makes sense. And I, mm -hmm. I'm trying to figure out myself, like what would be a solution to this so that you are not spinning your wheels and doing all this time. And then we also aren't, you know, covering all the things that, you know, Jan just said. So, mm -hmm. but I don't know what that is yet. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know that obviously you and your team have been thinking about this and these are the solutions you've come with up with for now, and that's why you're bringing it to us. I just feel like the mechanism, <laughs> we can continue to talk about this. Um, okay. So I'm gonna take the opposite tack. I'm gonna say that the restriction should be in weight against the town's investment. 
So $125,000, whether it's to stabilize a barn or to bring something into you know, full adaptive reuse, regardless, the town's investment is the same $125,000. And um, it may be that we can't, we just, you know, as much as I'd like to, it may be that we can't afford to save barns that aren't going to go into adaptive reuse simply for their physical presence in the bar, in the in the environment or that you know that that if if the if the preservation restriction makes it onerous i think what i'm getting from jane's side is that you know preservation restriction of, for a stabilized barn is just to keep it in a stabilized state which shouldn't be too complicated but um and the other piece that i would say is that you know it's this tricky balance between the town the town and its resources in terms of staffing and, and and our opinions about what should be done like i feel like we have an opinion what should be done in an ideal world and then the town has to live in the real world of how much time they can actually mm -hmm. put toward mm -hmm. this effort. So I want to defer, I want to defer part of the conversation back to the town to say, well, you guys are, you know, that, you know, we will, our, our positions will shift and we will come on and off this committee, but the town staff will be, you know, much more stable and you'll be the ones responsible for doing the bulk of the work. So I'm comfortable with the financial threshold. I don't know if it's a hundred thousand seems, I don't know if a hundred thousand is Right. I mean, I think ten thousand should be local. Twenty probably local. It's fifty. I mean, I, I guess that that's what I'm asking from my question from yeah. Ben. Would be, what do you on the town side feel like would work well with you know balancing the interests of you know being able to realistically put these preservation restrictions in place because if it takes a decade what difference does it make you know? <laughs> and you know being able to achieve what it is we're trying to achieve here and, and um then, yeah i uh i just had one other point about i, I think robin stated it well about kind of the per one of the purposes of the preservation restriction is, you know, it's first and foremost, it's to protect the town's investment. And so it's, you know, it obviously matters what the funds are being used for, but at the end of the day, you know, it's, you know, $125,000 on, yeah, like you said, stabilizing a barn versus, you know, doing a slate roof at the Conkey house or something, it's the same uh -huh. funds. But I, I also wanted to stay kind of just putting ourselves in the applicant's shoes for a second. Um, you know, for the, we, we, all, we want to encourage people to apply to uh, CPA funds, obviously, and a permanent restriction can be a, a kind of a scary thing for yeah. applicants. I don't know if they, I don't, obviously no one's thinking about <laughs> um, the indefinite future forever. And, you know, it's a lot to take on to, to plan that far ahead for your organization or your nonprofit or for your church. And so, um, you know, I think it's also important to not just support the really big, you know, $200,000 full restoration projects, but also the, you know, $10,000, $20,000 um, smaller projects. And so, you know, again, I don't know if the $100,000 number is where is uh, is the right number? You know, I, I feel like it it's good good enough for now. But um, I think that's kind of the other part of this is being able to encourage smaller um, projects to apply and not requiring them to get a full permanent restriction. Yeah, um, because that's it's often a deterrent. So if we agree that there should be this division of local and and state um that that can be kind of a starting place for us if we agree that that's a good idea um mm -hmm. and then details can come uh i don't know about i don't know about july then but <laughs> yeah um so catherine and then hetty <laughs> so um let me lower my hand ben i and i and you know 
fellow commissioners, I don't know if this is actually something we could do and it's smart, but I just want to riff on this. Could we just have it be a local restriction? Everyone has a local restriction, knowing that some of these folks within a 30 year period, so we can get the ball rolling so that nothing can change the property, that these people are probably gonna apply again and it'll encourage people to be able to go after these funds. And for that 30 year period, we would have got the restriction through on a local level. We don't have to bring in the state. And then we set up some sort of mechanism that we you know, check in with people as it, it is already, and that knowing they're probably gonna apply again within 30 years. And so at that point, we figure out, I just, I think what I hear from you, and I, I may be wrong, is that it just is taking so long to get these restrictions in place. And in that time period, you know, other changes could be made, or, you know, it's deterring people from applying for funds to buildings that are going under sort of, you know, neglect or require maintenance. And so if we just had it be a local restriction, would it cause more people to apply? And then, you know, the solution for your team is that you get this paperwork through and the restriction is in place already. And I, I mean, just problem solving, don't know if this actually makes sense. I'm, I'm curious to hear other thoughts. I, I know how I feel, but. <laughs> um, Patty. Uh, um, yeah. Just a couple of, of things. Uh, I used to work for an organization that um, had in its purview and a staff member wasn't their only job, but they, they would be the person to go out and on an annual basis review what were known as easements rather than restrictions. And I, I mentioned that because I think the word restriction just, just sets people off in a particular way mm -hmm. and maybe thinking part of our brainstorming might be to brainstorm the word easement, um, which is nationally recognized by um, preservation or conservation organizations as a, a useful term. Um, I, I also wonder whether Something to, something to consider is that, you know, maybe instead of the dollar amount, it, it, it could be, it could be um, determined by architectural significance or historic significance. Maybe there's some kind of, I know that's how, when I worked for the Frank Lloyd Wright Building Conservancy, which was a national organization, which had easements on its properties and we worked with property owners in some cases museums like I, I was at the time we were we were dealing with Frank Lloyd Wright you know it was so it was like but I think what might put people off is that they aren't in that category with their you know mid-Victorian house you know in the downtown so mm -hmm. uh, um, I'm not really sure where I'm going with any of this <laughs> I'm speaking a little bit before I've kind of completed my thoughts but but the easement conservate the the easement versus the restriction thing I think is is something that we might like to give a, a bit of thought to, for sure. Um, Becky, I'm going to pass for now. <laughs> ben can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think in Massachusetts that's how we do it. We don't do easements; we do restrictions. <laughs> yeah, because I, yeah. Yeah, nobody in Vermont has heard of a, a restriction. I mean, it seems like a very state specific thing. I don't know that there's that much difference. The one question I had in follow up was, again, with the restriction, you literally have an entity that comes and does an inspection every year. And is that in the town's area? Like, is, yeah. is, do, have we done that? Do we just kind of keep an eye on the Jones Library with its pending restriction? I mean, you know, it's, and, I mean, I, I learned recently that, you know, that there are organizations who will buy easements or who will take easements. I can't remember uh, how it works, um, but they know that, that it is there for their responsibility, that the, this is the work that has to be done that goes along with that. And I know from my work up in Greenfield that there's preservation restriction on the First National Bank, which no one comes to see every year. <laughs> and it's been in place since 1996. And I believe it's from the Mass Historic Commission. So I, I lean toward 
less complicated given the size of our town, less complicated. I think 30 mm -hmm. years is a great term. The less we have to kind of decide this way or that way between properties and the more streamlined yeah. it could be. Um, so I would, you know, I would be comfortable unless there's some sort of, you know, preservation practice and Jane would probably know better around this that suggests, oh no, that's not, you know, that that's the other place I would defer to is, you know, what do the professionals say? What, what did yeah. the professionals say yeah. would work well for a community of our size? It seems like a local 30 year restriction in our area would probably be a really good fit. Yeah, I can, I think I agree with that, but I, so I can say a little bit about the restrictions that, that I work with. Um, so both of these houses and the, all the grounds are under permanent restrictions and nobody from the town ever checks. Um, maybe mm -hmm. once every five years, someone from MHC comes out and does a site visit, but it's oh. very, it's really self-regulating. Um, so we, um, it, our restriction is largely, uh, so, sort of three areas. One is minor improvements, one is major improvements and by improvements, I mean, repairs and other things. And then the third is, um, uh, subsurface work. So subsurface work often triggers archeology. span Minor improvements, we don't, that, that's at our discretion. Major improvements, we always have to send in our plans to MHC um, to get reviewed and sometimes they might request changes. Um, but you are, your restriction is held by MHC. They are the holder of the restriction. Uh, yes, but, uh, so, so it's can, their, their responsibility to make sure that you honor the terms of the restriction. Uh, yes, but this is, has, this was quite complicated because the restriction originated with state funding. Then we got some federal funding. So the restriction had to be extended to the department of the interior. Okay. And then we got some local funding from CPA. So then the town had to get involved and it was the same project. The town and the feds funded the same project. So do you have three separate restrictions? No, they all had to, they all had to agree on the single restriction. Okay. That took three and a half years. Okay. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, so, I mean, it seems like the, the CPA funding, the local 30 restriction with, but I guess that would be my question for Ben to take back to the town is, could the town please explain to us what the enforcement mechanism is on the restriction? I'd be happy to have a 30 year restriction that said, you know, there would just be an annual Inspection by the town, but yeah. if there's no if there's no mechanism for enforcement, like I've seen up in Greenfield, and again that's an MHC restriction, then what is the point of the restriction? Like, why do we tie ourselves in knots? So one mechanism could simply be um, the preservation order. You know, when someone wants to make a change on a preferably preserved or a historically mm -hmm. significant building. We know from, say, the property card that there's a, a restriction on it. Mm -hmm. That seems pretty easy to me that okay. it's flagged when it comes up for some other kind of review. Mm -hmm. Right. So the only thing I'm thinking about, like if we gave $120,000 to preserve a barn and the barn just sits there and nobody fixes the roof over that 30 year restriction period, yeah. and you're not really honoring the intention of the restriction was to keep which was to keep the barn from falling down right that's where it gets more complicated yeah. so in an established structure to not change it is one thing but for something that could fall victim to uh you know demolition by neglect n not intentionally mm -hmm. but just that you know it, you know it doesn't have to be a lot just somebody's eyes on it once a year yeah you know? um yeah 
Jan Janice, your hand anew. Yes, oh. um, I was just gonna say another mechanism might be any time a permit is requested, a building permit, because you know you put a roof, you put a chimney, you anything that you want to do, you're gonna have to ask for a building permit. And the same thing you were saying about the property card with a significant building, could it also have the restricted building? Um, and so that would also clue the planning department that it, you know, it should be seen. Now that doesn't take care of what Robin was talking about with neglect, because if they're neglecting it, they're not going to be asking for building permits. But it was just another way of not having to worry about maybe annual inspections if we don't have the staff for it, but something that would bring it to the attention of the staff so that they would then notice it's it's been restricted and pay attention to the work that's planning to be done. And Ben, can CPA administrative funds be used to support annual inspections? Um, I don't know about that offhand, but I, I, I can say that um, we don't have an enforcement policy of any kind right now. Mm -hmm. um, and part of my uh, the policy statement I put together for, for review today was that there would be a new mechanism of annual monitoring. I don't know, pick a nice day every fall and go drive around to each of the, the structures in Amherst, uh, restricted structures in Amherst. And, you know, I, there would be a baseline documentation as part of each um, restriction. So you can kind of look at, see what it looked like when you put the restriction on and then see what changes have been made and what the condition is. Um, so that that was, and, you know, the, the same thing happens with conservation restrictions, like the, our conservation department is just kind of getting you know, a policy together as well to do more routine monitoring for conservation lands. Um, you know, for example, Kestrel Land Trust might hold some east, uh, conservation restrictions in Amherst and they, you know, because they have the staff for it, that's part of their routine is, is doing that monitoring. So I think it's something we're improving on in the town. And I think hopefully with guidance from this new policy will kind of become a more routine thing that, you know, there, there is this annual monitoring. Not to be a wet blanket, but I think it would be more than just driving around one day. You're gonna to have to contact the owners and get access to go inside because you know, the roof is leaking. You can't necessarily see that from outside and it could be rotting away the floor and you need to really go in there. Yeah, that's a lot of situations. You know? Yeah, maybe, maybe, to Robin's point, it, maybe to Robin's point, it does require more of a you know expert who can, who can bring on to yeah. sort of look at these things. But it sounds like, Ben, you're saying that the town is already thinking about uh, that annual, at the very least, an annual baseline, which, you know, which, which right. sounds like an, a, a big improvement over what has existed thus far. And, and my understanding from what I'm learning is that the, that's the expectation that when you hold an easement, if you hold a restriction, you're in charge. And so that's what we should understand as a committee is that the town, if the town holds the easement, it's in charge for making sure that the conditions of the easement are met on a, some sort of regular basis. Are there any that actually have gone into effect that have passed through all that paperwork and that we hold? Um, yeah, there are a few. Um, I don't know them offhand, but it, I know the old, uh, certainly the Dickinson Museum and the Evergreens, the, uh, I think the Strong House and the, uh, the do, um, I think the UU Church one has gone through. Yes. Um, and I, I will say another issue, not to <laughs> add, add another <laughs> complication to this, is that um, another issue with it taking so long to implement these. Uh, uh, restrictions is that the the applicant needs to be a willing partner as well in this whole thing. And um, if they've already expended the money to to do their repairs, which you know in most cases it's an emergency and they need to do it ASAP, um, they don't they lose that incentive to sign the restriction. And so obviously you know the Jones Library they're you know part of the town and they're fully willing and ready to sign the restriction a decade later, but um, we've run into that issue with some of the other uh, applicants because they just, you know, they, they nitpick it apart and they, they have no reason to accept the restriction anymore. 
and because they've done a lot of the work already. So um, yeah, we're, you know, part of this policy is hopefully to, you know, really make it clear that you can't get the money until you sign the restriction, right. which right. which then puts it back on staff to get the restriction done. You know, I'm already I'm right. already starting the draft for the conference house and Hopefully. And to go back to what Jane said, then we should talk about what the, the restriction really involves, you know, try and make it less onerous to an owner yeah. uh, and make more sense, be more transparent. Um, so let, let me sort of take a, a, a time check here. And um, are we generally in, in favor of proceeding with a, a local and permanent restriction policy? Or I like Catherine's idea of just local. Me too. <laughs> Me too. We want a, a I, I mean, the Jones Library got a million <laughs> from us. <laughs> I mean, that was for the special collections, but I mean, do we want a really high threshold? <laughs> or permanent restriction. I mean, you know, just like we, we make it easy on ourselves up to a certain point, but at a certain point, you know, is it $250,000 that warrants permanent restriction? $500,000? I, I, I was sort of what I was thinking, like, what's this, what is the mechanism? I don't necessarily know that the financial threshold, but like perhaps something is written into this policy that says like, we decide like, this sort of building, if it's this, I mean, if it's truly a million dollars, if there's like a bonded process, like that would be something that is a mechanism that it becomes, you know, a permanent restriction. I, but I don't know. Or a percentage of the worth, you said something about that then. Right. That's the formula used for like the, I think like the Mass Architectural Advisory Board. If it's, if whatever the work is going to be, is worth 30% of the value of the property, then that kicks in a whole set of other requirements. Mm -hmm. So it could be something like that, but I, uh, well, I, I'll say this. I think we should proceed with this. Um, I think uh, my feeling is we shouldn't kick out the permanent restriction yet until we talk about what the nature of the restriction might be. Okay. But, um, but Ben, you have some questions on the on the last page of this. Are these questions that you would that you would like for us to discuss tonight? Okay. Um, let's see. What the, what were my questions? Uh, so yeah, I think there's just kind of a general question from you know the town manager's office, kind of like who if 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 the historical commission agrees on a policy, um, who like who owns that? Is it does the town council need to get involved? Does the CPA commission need to be, you know, ratify the policy or so kind of just and it this isn't or is it just kind of town staff, like procedural kind of thing? So um we don't really have an answer on that yet, but it's uh just maybe just a, a question I had in mind. Um well the historical commission holds yeah we we are the the town body that yeah is is that authorizes or signs off on these restrictions so that seems pretty yeah yeah clear. there's no doubt that the historical commission would need to um adopt the policy i guess it's who else needs to be informed you know at a certain point you bring in too many different committees and boards to put together a policy and it, it just gets harder and harder and harder so well we had um, experience with that this past week yeah exactly <laughs> um yeah i think all the other questions were you know we've kind of touched on them um uh do, do, do. yeah i guess there's another thing that often comes up in preparing these uh, restrictions is whether it's on the property or just the building and that's kind of often what 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 gets tangled up you know for example the conkey house trying to figure this out now, it's part of the, the entire Salem Place Condo Association. And so it's like somehow we need to stipulate that the restriction would just be on the Conkey House and kind of the historic mm -hmm. 
you know, grounds around the Conkey house, but, you know, the Salem Place condo owners, they can do whatever they want. Um, so it's like, and then obviously that's kind of a very unique situation. Um, but, you know, I think MA, the State Historical Commission wants restrictions to be on the entire property. So finding a way to do that at the Conkey house is proven tricky, I guess. Um, that's interesting, yeah, because that's yeah. where local versus state local versus permanent that's another aspect of that yeah yeah so yeah so i think i'm fine to table this for now i think it was i um, glad we were able to broach the topic i i will check with uh my colleagues just to figure out kind of when the state does need to get involved i, I think they, they do need to ratify or they need to approve of permanent restrictions i know that but um, I don't think there's anything that says they have to uh, approve of um, projects up to a certain threshold. You know, I think I think over in Northampton, they they in Northampton they typically they they apply for more um, state uh, grants from the state historical commission, so they get a lot of um, uh, survey and planning grants and you know pr uh, historic preservation grants from the state and, and those come with the requirement for a, a permanent restriction. We don't get as, a, we don't often apply for those grants because we have, you know, CPA can cover a lot of projects here, but in Northampton, they often, I'm sure Robin would love to hear this, they often uh, leverage uh, CPA funds with state grants. And so they almost, always, or they often use a uh, permanent restriction anyway, but that's, a requirement from the state from because they're getting state money as opposed to the right uh, they're getting that state money so their <laughs> yeah. CPA money can go somewhere yeah. else we'll have that discussion <laughs> later <laughs> yeah uh yeah I think there's some of us who have a lot to say about that <laughs> I'm not gonna say it right now <laughs> well actually I wrote it down for unanticipated items oh good <laughs> uh, yeah uh Okay, so um, this is great. This I think this has been a really, really interesting yeah. and useful discussion. So we'll we'll forge ahead with this, and maybe next time we discuss it, we can sort of just take take a couple of prongs of it at, at, uh, and wrestle with those, and then move on the, to the next prongs after that. Um, super. Um, Okay, the uh, preservation bylaw proposal. So we have a new, this looks like a, this looks almost like a typeset copy. copy. Mm -hmm. What happened here? It's getting to look professional. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, great, does the Jane or Jan wanna give a recap of the planning board meeting? I think, what was that, just two weeks ago? I don't think my heart can take it. <laughs> <laughs> um, interesting. Yeah, it, uh, well, it, you know, in some ways it was, a, well, it, I think it was a, an effective, you know, presentation. We sort of did a tag team with uh, me and Jan and, and Ben. Um, there were, of course, a number of uh, questions about certain parts of it. Um, some that we were uh, expecting, and I think had, uh, you know, had addressed uh, already in the text of the bylaw, and then others that came forward. Um, Jan, how's your heart doing? <laughs> Okay, I'm trying to remember what the big one was. I just realized I completely blanked it out. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the big one, which we couldn't answer and is still outstanding. I'm just totally blanking. I think I'm repressing it. Um, what was that then? My, my recollection is, you know, one of the themes was uh, just how homeowners know about this process in general. Yeah. And yeah. like, and just they, the planning board encouraged the historical commission to, uh, you know, or you know, 
uh, refine and finish and the, the town inventory of historic structures and kind of use that as a basis for the determination of significance. And maybe that's a long-term goal or medium-term goal to get there, but they encouraged us that um, that might be a, a better way to kind of give homeowners some uh, clarity and uh, assurances, you know, one way or another with which way it's going to go. Um, well, they were, they were, that was sort of like the nice part of yeah. saying that we, I got the impression that we don't inform homeowners soon enough that if they want to do something, they're going to have to go through us. And we kind of came to a, I think, kind of a stalled point where we were just saying, we're here once somebody applies for demolition and they're saying, they were saying that we should somehow have already let people know that their structures could come under our supervision. You know, like, like, well, remember I talked about maybe we need to do newspaper articles about if your house is this old or if your house is in this district or something, because people don't know it. But that felt like one of the things that we couldn't kind of resolve. Right? I kind of felt, I, I sort of felt like we came to not a complete resolution, but that we were headed in the same direction. That, I mean, I don't disagree that, that there has to be a better way for homeowners and potential buyers to know the potential status of their of their home or any or the changes they want to make and that i think is going to become simpler with um, the preferably preserved status mm -hmm. but i thought that i thought we sort of sent the message that yeah we want to yeah, we want to finish our inventory. We have a lot of we have a lot of structures inventory, but it's there's still a bit more to do, and that's going to put us in a better position to to be you know explicit about uh, buildings that for owners uh, more explicit for owners about buildings that may fall under this um, bylaw, but that it's going to take some time. I hope I hope they understood it's going to take some time. Yeah, I felt like towards the end, Tom Long kind of brought everything together and, and seemed more positive towards us because there was quite a bit of opposition and then he kind of wrapped it up better by the end. But um, I know there were other things. I just can't remember what they were. Jane, can I jump in for a second? Yeah. Um, I had an experience. I, I'll preface this by saying that I think the expectation that a homeowner knows exactly what is coming down the pike is unrealistic and, and an unfair burden to place at our feet. And I will say that I had an experience where I owned a two family home. I was on town meeting when a bylaw was adopted that said, if you were an owner occupier of a multifamily property, I don't know if it was two family or a uh, more, but I was a two family, you could not sell your property to someone who wasn't an owner occupier. And I'd forgotten, even though I was in that town meeting, I was never delivered anything to my mailbox that said that this bylaw applied to me. I knew it did because I was in town meeting. I'd forgotten about it. I went about to sell my house and I had to go through a review process that was delayed twice due to just people not being able to come to a meeting and make form. I waited five months or I didn't have rental income <laughs> coming into my property because I was subject to this bylaw and no one ever made any apologies to me or an expectation. Like it's just part of what happens, you know? And I think it's, it's, you know, it's, I mean, it's, it's fine for us to want to do as much as we can to inform people, but things come up. Like, it's just the nature of things. Um, I mean, that was, that it was, it was a very frustrating, painful experience. And I almost didn't get a waiver to sell my house. 
due to opposition. So I think, um, you know, we can kind of forward th think these things to the point where like the homeowner is always, you know, so burdened by our expectations, but it, it doesn't happen just in our area. There are other things that can come up and, and I just wanted to share that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it sounds awful, but you understand that what we're doing is we're trying to get the planning um, folk to approve this to take it to town council. So we just have I to- I know, I know. I mean, all right, concerns. fair enough. I just, you know. I, I also think that, that you know, if, if we made that effort and if we succeeded in having an inventory, that actually- Yes. That, that, that's, a, that's a big bonus. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, I think, I, mean, I guess what I'm saying is that it's better than, you know, maybe other people, you know, under, under, yeah. under other bylaws will experience. And we can make it a positive thing. I mean, we can get that inventory done and then the town can send out a, a letter to every one of those homeowners that says, congratulations, you have <laughs> a home that is considered significant. <laughs> it happens to restrict you to these, you know, situations, but... I love it. <laughs> yeah. Um, Catherine? Nope. Okay. Uh, ben? Yeah. Um, gee, I guess that, that was kind of my main uh, takeaway from the planning board meeting. Um, I will say, su subsequently from the planning board meeting, um, I think the uh, town staff, the building commissioner, planning director, we uh, we did take a closer look at the bylaw. And I know, you know, I, I'm familiar with it in and out, but I think, you know, it only, um, the building commissioner and others have only taken a super close look at it now that it's kind of getting out into the public a bit. And so um, the building commissioner and planning director, and, and even I, to a certain extent, do have some uh, concerns with a few parts of the, actually maybe just one aspect of the bylaw that I was hoping to um, bring up today with, it has to do with the definition of demolition. And uh, we did talk to Jane about it last week. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, I was part of this discussion and um, I think there are some, uh, you know, I, I, I'd like for Ben to, to kind of take us through um, what town staff are concerned about, because if we if we back this whole process up to its point of origin, where you know an application for a building permit or a preservation order comes in, um, you know what what are the sort of practical steps that um, depend on clarity of definitions and process, and so. I, I think there is a good point here um, yeah. and some potential solutions. So, yeah. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I guess I'm looking at this as like, obviously the, the preservation bylaw is, you know, one of the more important tools that the historical commission and the town have for historic preservation. So it's, you know, I think, and we recognize that in town hall. And so I don't want you to think we're trying to detract from it in any way. I think we're all, I'm also looking at it as like, okay, this is a policy that I'm implementing and the, the building commissioner is looking at it that way as well. Whereas, you know, he's technically the, the enforcement officer for all, you know, the code enforcement officer. So, um, and his staff is the one who kind of is the first point of contact for a lot of homeowners. So it just kind of occurred to us that, um, and I can share my screen just so we can all look at the language. The uh, demolition definition part C um, focuses on, so part A is the total demolition. Part B is, you know, 25% of any facade. And then part C is the act of changing, modifying, or removing important architectural elements from a building which elements contribute to the historic integrity of the design, including but not limited to walls, roofs, structures, doors, windows, stoops, porches, chimneys, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so like Jane said, I guess if you, if you back this up till the, um, to, to actually thinking through how this bylaw will be implemented, um, you know, so when someone is, 
you know, as homeowners, you probably already know this, but, you know, if you're looking to um, make a change to your house and it, it's something that requires a building permit, you know, you or, you know, your contractor working on your behalf would submit a building permit to the town. Um, you know, we, that, that then comes into one of our permit administrators who uh, reviews it and kind of sends it to the to the right down the right path, whether it's to an inspector or to a planning department staff. And so, um, you know, the way it works now is, or I guess the way it will work if 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 this bylaw is in, in place as it is now is essentially the first flag would be is the structure is the building fifty years or older in question here, and then if not, you know. Um, it, it goes right along, but I think the first threshold is, is it 50 years or older? And then if so, is it for, you know, essentially, is it for a building permit that has anything to do with an exterior change? And so um, I think it's, you know, we, we ran some numbers uh, just last week and, you know, we estimate that could be over, over 300 permits per year that kind of meet that criteria. So over 50, under, yeah, over 50 years old and for a exterior alteration. And so the concern is, is that, um, you know, that that's potentially like five to six a week, for example, that would, would need to be, would need to go down this process of first determining if it's a significant building um, involved. And if not, then it can just move right along. Um, and if it is, it would be reviewed by the Historical Commission at a public hearing. But I think even just the idea of, uh, you know, potentially 250 to 300 uh, projects needing to be reviewed for significance um, because they involve changing or modifying an important architectural element, you know, involved in this list, for example, um, just seem like it's 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 uh, it would be a lot of uh, work added workload and I think we don't want to um, this is I mean we are, I think we in town hall certainly recognize the importance of this section because it's not just full demolition that's important for preservation it's not just you know twenty five percent of the a, a facade but you know there's certain elements like the you know, cupola on a building or, you know, the, it really nice trim that are, you know, integral to the property. But so we're just trying to find a balance between um, finding a way to protect those details, but also not needing to potentially convene this group uh, to determine significance like five to six times a week, which is not, <laughs> I don't think what anyone had in mind for this bylaw. Um, so there's a few um, ideas we had. Um, one, you know, I think we, we struggled to find a way to like clean up the language to make it um, clear. I think I, I, I think we can, there's only so much we can do to clean up the language because at the end of the day, um, we're, we're not expecting our permit administrators to kind of like and be the ones to interpret this. They they just need to know where to send it quickly. And so, um, we had suggested maybe we we use um, the, the the town's inventory as it stands now, as you know, say add some language in here that um, say that this section only applies to structures that are on the town's inventory, and obviously that inventory is going to change over time and hopefully get to a point where it's finalized. Um, but for now, we thought that could be a way of, uh, of kind of filtering out um, when those changes need to be reviewed. Um, another option could be also to kind of just have a separate age threshold for Section C. Maybe this is only for, you know, pre-World War II or pre-1900 homes. I, I think that creates a little bit of confusion, but um, that could be an idea for, for, for filtering as well. But um, yeah, so I just wanted to present that change. And, you know, I think we want to make sure it's addressed kind of before the 
bylaw moves uh, moves along too much further. Um, and uh, no one brought it up at the planning board meeting, but which I was surprised about, but we kind of realized it after the fact it was an issue. Okay, thanks, Ben. There, there's, there will be one other thing we want to specifically talk about that did come up at the planning board meeting, but um, focusing on this first, Robin. Oh, I'm unmuted. Um, I would just say that if there were an additional threshold for a separate th threshold, I'd, I'd be more comfortable with a rolling threshold, any, you know, not a fixed date, because that, that will just have to be changed later. That's my only comment. Sorry, the roll, rolling threshold? Well, you said that, um, you said, you know, it might only apply to pre World War. I'm not sure which role oh, more. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, as opposed to picking fixed date, yeah. pick a, a a number of years if it's okay. different than the regular threshold. If it's yeah. 75 or I don't know, 75 yeah. looks longer, 75 years instead of 25. But that way every year it automatically refreshes itself. We don't have to go and revisit it later. I kind of think it would be confusing to have two separate thresholds. Um, I kind of lean in, in favor of the, the uh, language that includes, uh, it might be something like the act of changing, modifying, removing important architectural elements from a building listed in the MACRIS database or the town inventory, because I'm not sure they're really identical. Um, except for exemptions as found, blah, blah, blah. But um, I'd rather see that than a year yeah. used because we already have the 50 year mark. And if we start saying anything more modern than X year, it has a different qualification. Then we're not really serious about things that aren't as old. And something like changing windows on a mid-modern house could be a major, you know, redesign. So I, I prefer what Jane is suggesting to a year um, cutting off cutoff point. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I see others nodding their head. <laughs> yeah. I that, that makes a lot of sense to me, if we can use that kind of wording and, and description. Okay, that's super, that's great. Do we still um, need to meet with Janet McGowan about her detailed concerns? Um, so yeah, Chris uh, Brestrup and I did actually yesterday okay. um, in, in the morning and uh, yeah, she presented a whole, um, you know, track changes, uh, you know, bylaw to me um, with a lot of her edits incorporated. And um, so I just, I just, I, I responded to them, you know, in the meeting, but I just haven't had time to fully digest all of her suggestions and the, um, and kind of incorporated into a clean copy. A lot of them were um, just pretty helpful, you know, clar tips about clarifying the procedure and kind of who needs to be notified when and um, and kind of uh, especially like how the dates you know the, the completion of an application is one date and then you know, so we, we kind of walked through that and that was really helpful um, but I just I haven't had time to kind of really go through them and, and, and adopt it into a clean copy um, Janet had one other suggestion but I, um, but I wanted to let Jane go first to see if you, you had mentioned there was something else from the planning board meeting. It might be the same thing that you're thinking about. It's um, down here in the definition of significant building. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, so there was some, you know, concern about, okay, if it's just one, if this first, this first pass at at, fi at finding a building significant is if this is just handled by uh, a, a planning department staff person and one commission member, then the the concern was about 
the historical commission not having enough um, kind of influence over that review. So the idea was to um, not pin it down that specifically, but put uh, change the wording as you see it here and what Ben set out, a, a building found by at least one member of the commission so that, so that there could be more than one, so that the, the specifics about the composition of that first review group um, are, are flexible uh, instead of fixed. So it could be like that one member meets with a town planning staff member, but uh, a notification goes out to the whole commission that this is coming up at or, that meeting and they could can, everybody can look at it before it goes to them or something. That's one possibility, or it could be, say, two member, two commissioners meet oh, with planning yeah. department staff. Yeah, just to just to you know expand the role of the commission a little bit. And that this, I don't know, this seems to me to be nicely flexible. Sure. Yeah, I think it's good to have flexible language in a bylaw because it, it's such a pain to change it as we've. <laughs> gone through now. So it's um, what another actually in our meeting yesterday with Janet, she had suggested um, it could be something like a building determined by the commission or its designees. Um, so it, 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 it even allows for the full commission to, to right. look at yeah, significance. That's I mean, or, at some point we might yes. lose Ben and get some schmuck in his place, and then right, we, yeah. we would have a, we'd have more. We don't want to have an even vote with him. We want to mm -hmm. outvote him. Yeah, exactly. I mean, not you, the person who might him yeah. or her who might vote. Yeah. No, and I think it's good to kind of there might yeah exactly there might be a time where the commission does want to kind of retain the um, power to or the the responsibility to determine significance maybe that's at a public meeting as opposed to a public hearing or something but um or maybe it's the you give it the responsibility to the chair for a little while or something so it's um and i think i will say not to always point to northampton but that that is how they do it they have uh kind of like three different options laid out and i think they their staff person kind of determine, or in, in conjunction with the chair, they kind of determine which, whether it rises to the occasion of the full commission to determine whether they can- Their commission them. sitting around, sit around saying, you know, in Amherst, they do it this way. <laughs> <laughs> they talk about us. <laughs> I'd be curious whether we're a model for anybody. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Probably like uh, to do so. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so yeah, I, I, I agreed with, um, Janet's sentiment that uh, just adding flexible language um, could help. Yeah, I mean, you know, I I left that meeting thinking that you know this was this was getting better and better, and you know we've made progress, and it's um, it's probably in its final stages of adjustment. So um, I know that the 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 planning board wanted to see it again um, before forwarding it to the town council. So I think that's where we are. And as soon Ben, uh, you get to make all the edits. Congratulations. Yep. Yeah. You've been selected. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but we have to meet with them again. So you know, Jane, you and I can't go off this commission for at least another five years at the rate things are going. <laughs> no, this will this will this will come through. Right. When it does, it'll be sayonara. <laughs> You're next in line, Jan. For what? For You're what? The heir, You're the heir apparent. <laughs> no, no. I've been on longer. I'm 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 the heir Disappearing. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, we can go on to the minutes. I move that we uh, approve the minutes from January 12th, 2022. I Sarah, second. Okay, thank you. I, I would just like to add Cindy Harbison's last name. 
Oh, and could you correct my last name spelling? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, no, it's funny on the uh, sometimes on Zoom calls, uh, it was just Cindy's uh, first yeah. first name, but uh, yeah, I can definitely. I didn't know who it was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, and I, I should note the uh, um, the preservation. The, oh God, I'm getting there. The historic structures report. I just I, I put together a web a web page uh, for the final document and for the video and for the the PowerPoint slides. Um, so that project is is squared away. We'll we'll get the uh, hard copies uh, in the next week or so. Okay. But, yeah. yeah so I, I'm still like so I was so blown away by that presentation. It was really good. Yeah. Yeah, it was really good. Yeah. Um, let's see. Um, okay, so now we vote. Uh, unless there are any other comments? We have um, a second? Yes, um, Catherine seconded. Okay. Is this to, uh, for the minutes? Minutes. Yes. Okay, yeah. Okay. So all in favor, say, I think we're all on the same, we're all on the same screen, so we can raise our hands. Uh, all in favor, that's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so is, is there any, Ben, did you do these minutes? I think so, yeah, yeah. Is there anyone who would be willing to take minutes in the future? Can we brown robin it? I, 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 will, I will have to, I would say I would in my heart, but I'm not good at being present and typing on a computer. It's just like my skills well, are so poor. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I actually don't have a huge issue doing it. I, um, okay. it's, I, I just kind of have the uh, agenda up right here that I'm just kind of filling in notes as we go. Um, okay. I don't, if I, if I seem uh, distracted, that's what I'm doing over here. But, um, usually. Oh, happens. that's good to know. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's not like I'm watching TV. Right now, so. <laughs> <laughs> thought he was watching TV. Yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, if you're okay with that, Ben, that's yeah. fine, but I don't, you know, I don't want you to have to, like, do everything all at once. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. Um, I mean, if there's anyone who's really excited about the opportunity, <laughs> <laughs> I would invite someone to, but it's okay. All right. I did my uh, time in Greenfield. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, so now we get to public comment. And I don't know if there are, let's okay, see. Um, Hilda here. Hilda, would you like to make a comment? You have three minutes. Yeah, we are talking about macros and I've been spending a lot of time playing with the interactive maps on, on macros for various articles that I'm writing. And it, it occurred to me while I'm listening to you talk that in the downtown central, his, central historic, local historic district, there's like green dots everywhere of houses that are on the macros in, inventory. And then I'm thinking that at the time that the sunset Lincoln Historic Commission Study Committee was set up. We had asked for one in North Amherst too. And, and Pat Holland was working on her book and had history on all kinds of houses up here. We have lots of old houses that don't appear on any inventory, including my own and, and all of these Roswell Field Putnam houses up here that aren't protected. And so they're not on macros, they're not on the local inventory. How do they get? How do we? How do we get our houses saved? That that's that's what I'm curious about under under these various bylaws, um, and what's happening with demolition by neglect. I mean, thinking of one famous barn up here where the owner refuses to fix the roof for more than thirty years now, and it happened to be her grandfather's favorite barn. How do you how do you make these? And, on, and on every time I drive by the North Amherst Church, I get hot sick because the paint is peeling so badly and part of the woodwork is rotting off that and they're not maintaining it. So, I mean, where do things like that fit in these various bylaws that you're working on? That, that's the issue I wanted to bring up. The North Amherst Church is obviously in a historic district, so that is semi-protected, but the, I don't think things maybe the the Putnam houses uh, some of them are included I don't remember where the line is but 
certainly there are, you know, 18th century houses that have passed Summer Street. So somewhere I want to know how that's going to fit in down the line, that they, that they don't get demolished by neglect or whatever. Okay, thank, thank you, Hilda. Um, do, you, do you have your hand up, Robin? Yeah, yeah, I was just going to say, I imagine some of the um, direction on demolition by neglect, neglect is going to come out of that preservation plan that we talked about. I didn't hear what you said. Oh, I said that um, direction for the historical commission and the town on a demolition by neglect bylaw, which would be uh, presumably a separate standing bylaw would the direction for that would come out of the update to the preservation plan that we just okay. talked about. Because it is a long and complicated process as was the um, demolition delay or preservation bylaw. Jane, can't uh, individual homeowners apply for MACRIS listing? It, it, to tell the truth, anyone can submit a form B yeah. for any property. So a homeowner may do that. Yeah. So Hilda, do does do people know each other? Some of these that own these homes, could they get together and all fill out? A lot of them are rental, oh. like along Summer Street. Yeah. They were all mill houses when there were mills around the dam. Yeah. But any any active citizen can submit a form to Macris, right? It doesn't have to be the owner. I believe that's correct. And, you know, thinking about the homes on Summer Street, a lot of the, a lot of the narrative that a Form B needs can be basically the same narrative for every one of those houses. Yeah. A little bit of, a little bit of specific information about each. And Meadow Street looks terrible. That's totally gone. Yeah, uh, we've lost that one. Mm -hmm. But the assessor cards also can be a source of information mm -hmm. to be yeah. transferred to a, a Form B. That's right. Oh, thank you for bringing up the assessor cards because in the conversation with Rob Mora and um, Chris Restrup, I, I asked how easy it would be to get, to get this designation information onto an assessor card. You know, like if it shows up in MACRIS or if it shows up in the town inventory or if we've said it's preferably preserved and um, it's, it's not difficult at all, apparently. We just right. need to give, give the town a list. Mm -hmm. So that's, and, that's pretty yeah. great, yeah. yeah. And one, one can access assessor cards online. And so yeah. it's possible if there's a question to see what's already there and then mm -hmm. recommend what should be added. Mm -hmm. Are you saying assessor card and you also mean property information card, same thing? Same thing. Same, same thing. thing. Okay. Okay. So Hilda, that means that you could go ahead and fill out a, a, a form B for your house. Mm -hmm. For anyone's house. Yeah. Anyone's house, yeah. Are they in town hall or on town? We're going to go on to unanticipated items. Um, so we have an email from um, Bruce Coldham um, about North Amherst Community Farm barn. Um, basically, they thought they could, you know, repurpose some of the wood from the barn with the assistance of Community Preservation Act funds, but um, uh, that was not granted. So, um, Robin? Um, yeah, I read uh, Bruce's comment and uh, my response to it, uh, and Jane can weigh in with her much more expertise, is that, I mean, first of all, that CPA is for preservation restoration, Rehabilitation or acquisition, is that right? I can't remember. I can't remember the four R. Yes. But it would have, but but none of uh, the, the activity of 
of disassembling a barn and, and reassembling it into a different um, entity just does not fall under the category of preservation. It's not a preservation practice. It's a fabulous repurposing. It's a great last resort for a building that has reached its end point, but the purpose of CPA is for preservation of things that are in existence. And so I would disagree. I, I'm fabulously impressed with the work that they do there. And I would disagree with his assessment that um, that, that decision was made in error. I think it was absolutely uh, the correct decision. Um, and that my understanding is that even disassembling something and reassembling it somewhere else is not considered preservation in the field. So this would be one step further away from that. That's really unfortunate because that's something that's really being pushed now is to um, reassemble, repurpose, reuse, never. Yeah, and I, I mean, I think that that's, I, I think that we all, certainly our commission appreciates that and we encourage, you know, our, our properties that we, that we give permission for demolition. We really encourage that repurposing of the materials. The trick is that, that the legislation is very specific and, and the purpose of the, it doesn't fit the purpose of the legislation. So it's disappointing in the regard that there is an other funding for that, but it's not disappointing in the sense that it's just, it doesn't fall under that law. Let me get the law changed. <laughs> well, you just get a different funding pot. <laughs> Any other comment? Um, Bruce Coldham's email does indicate that um, they will be working with a barn deconstruction group. Um, the material will be salvaged. But not uh, for, their use, for their use. But not used for in the way that we discussed about constructing a smaller uh, structure. And it'll probably go elsewhere. It won't be there at that farm. Right. That's too bad. Okay. Um, then let's see. The other unanticipated item was uh, a discussion at the finance committee, the town finance committee meeting. Um, I believe that was just yesterday. Was that just yesterday? I think it was um, just yesterday. Yeah. Um, Sarah Marshall, the chair of the Community Preservation Act Committee um, let us know that there were some uh, concerns on the part of the Finance Committee about um, probably particularly about the Conkey Stevens House um, CPA proposal and maybe slightly somewhat less uh, concerned about the Amherst Women's Club proposal, these being um, private properties, although the Women's Club is actually a 501c3. Um, but a uh, significant concern about um, directing CPA funds toward uh, a privately owned um, project. Uh, so um, Robin wrote something very uh, persuasive about the nature of preservation and how difficult a concept it can be to understand if that's not sort of what you think about all the time. And I tried to write something else, but Robin really covered the whole territory very nicely. So um, uh, then I had to get off and go to work. So I can't really talk about what the, what the rest of the conversation was like, but please, Robert, go ahead. Um, so I stayed on and I listened um, after Jane and I spoke. Uh, I think um, a couple of the members made it, made statements where they said they were, it was quite, they were quite clear about appreciating all our arguments and um, sort of being in agreement with them. And yet there was, and I'm just going on memory, I didn't take notes, but there was uh, from Lynn, is it Greismeyer, is that her last name? Um, uh, a strong statement from her about, 
a tremendous amount of discomfort with this amount of funds, um, a suggestion that perhaps, I don't know if she was, I mean, she must have been specific to historic preservation, that, there that, that maybe they should put a cap on how much we could spend on it. Um, Sonia Aldrich did correct her at one point to say that the town council could Town Council could limit um, that the rules are that that when the CPA puts a recommendation forward for a certain amount of money, Town Council can lower that amount of money. They can't increase it. They can never increase it. They, they, can't, they do have the ability to lower it. Um, what and, and the uh, Finance Committee decided to set the two historic preservation projects aside. Um, there was discussion about and there was some anxiety or concern about the nature of the preservation restrictions to protect the town's investment, which was another argument. Um, but um, I was concerned about this idea that, that I think Lynn went further to say, to, in, in my mind, she, she suggested that maybe we shouldn't fund these two projects because what other projects might come forward next year that we need to fund which I found was um, not in alignment with the purpose of, of the CPA committee and its recommendations. I mean, town council does, they have a vote. I don't, I don't know what that ends up looking like, but um, there was a, just a tremendous amount of discomfort <laughs> with these projects. And um, the only thing that I wanted to add to this committee's discussion is that I'm also a little unnerved by the lack of um, structure that goes around these, particularly these larger grants. That um, I think the Hills House only had one estimate. Uh, they sought advice from the town. The town at that point was Anthony said one estimate was fine. I, we don't have any definitive guidelines but I think guidelines to suggest the same way that you do kind of generally in procurement is you seek, you seek three estimates, whether we should have guidelines about seeking estimates for these big jobs from preservation uh, specialized firms, at least one. We had no capacity for comparison uh, with the Hills um, um, proposal. So I, I personally I personally would love to see more clarity around the CPA process, particularly around historic preservation projects, especially as they get it to these higher financial levels. Um, there is the issue of the preservation restriction. And there is also my question for Ben, I, I probably asked it before and I'll ask it again, who is supervising the requirement that the work conform to the Secretary of Interior Standards, which I'm learning all about this semester. So you guys will get really tired of me. <laughs> but um, I'm not, I wasn't paying close of attention and I'm not a, a, on the committee, but, um, and I don't know that I would have before this semester would have known enough to say, okay, does this, who is the person? Is it someone in the town? Should the town be putting CPA money towards a preservation specialist to fill in that piece? So that the work conforms to the standards. So there's a whole bunch of that stuff that I that I agree mm -hmm. that we re would really benefit with more clarity around. But I don't. I, I felt very uncomfortable with the idea that council would vote down these two projects, uh, or at least one member might, <laughs> on the basis of freeing up more money for projects that we don't even know the existence or, you know, in a worst case scenario that the town knows are coming, um, you know, they have to be evaluated on their own merits. And, um, so that's, that's my I don't understand this concern with private ownership. It was only two years ago that a member, I think it was a member of the CPAC committee got in touch with me as head of district five neighborhood association to ask that, um, they could advertise to homeowners that they want more personal private applications instead of just you know businesses think, and entities and now I, they're saying they don't want i no, think i think that just it's finance, finance committee is 
Yeah. Some members of the finance committee are objecting to, to private ownership. And in fact, had said during this meeting that, well, yeah, this property is eligible, but I'm not sure we want to spend our CPA funds that way. In yeah. other words, I mean, I, I think the point that I was trying to make probably not very well was that, okay, the, the property, the owner is eligible and the work they want to do is eligible. So if this has been endorsed by two separate town citizen committees, how can the finance committee reverse or, or just sort of delete yeah. um, well, that, that kind of project? Yeah, and I, I can say that in the CPA committee, the concern which um, both Hetty and then I made I made a point of making public comment to craft was the idea that you can't fund um, a private entity. And, and then the further point that I made at the finance committee was this really challenging aspect of understanding that yes, Salem Place is going to benefit from these funds to improve their building, to repair their building, but that the CPA funds function in this overlapping way, that that money also provides the public benefit to the people of the town to experience the building. And that is the hard thing that's hard, the, the thing that's hard to understand is that the public view is a public benefit and that was what I spoke to. And it seemed like once Jane and I got done talking, they were like, okay, we, we totally agree with you, but this is, at, the, at that point, I felt like they were like, this is too much money to spend on historic preservation. I mean, that was my takeaway was that there was this like gut instinct of like, you know, we have to, we have to make decisions about who, you know, eligibility and being worthy and being able to not fund everyone if you want to hold things in reserve. And by the way, I think there is still a $600,000 reserve. So that's not a very good argument. Um, also, it was interesting that they played it played off against the track, which it you know it just it's like I apples, felt yeah, yeah apples and oranges you know um, I'm sure that's, that's that was the sense that I got that the track was sort of the track is this huge project is the track funded yet is it been approved I can't remember Ben do you know Benny do you remember <clears throat> did we did CPA I think they still need to establish a, 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 an orientation and a plan for the right track. right so it still yeah. hasn't been approved and i think maybe that might have been like you know the, the the thing in the background of saying there's this huge project coming and how can we give this is all my interpretation i'm reading into it but it was this feeling of like we have you know we have big projects coming and how can we give and they're town-wide sports oriented things which is more important than historic structures right I mean, look at as it is you know so i think yeah i think the the you know i mean I, I i made a couple notes and i thought that you know we might have to speak again at the at the next forum you know just to, to make those points i mean that was how do you also you listen to the, well, the, yeah, the I deliberation mean, I think, too yes, I, I stayed until about 11 15 and okay. and it was really helpful to hear you know the context and the history that you know I, I just joined very recently so and I I feel like there's a lot of context here that that maybe we should be privy to I mean there was clearly a reference to an earlier um, CPA um, funded historic preservation project I think the um, uh, Jewish I knew you were going to say that. Yeah, they've been fighting us all this time. <laughs> but I think, I, yeah, I think it was, I think it really just, it's really hard to conceive of this very intangible benefit of the public view up against a church, you know, or, a, you know, even the Hills House, like during when I made public comment in the CPA committee meeting, it was clear that members of the committee thought, oh, well, because Hills House is a nonprofit and because you can go inside it, 
it's more worthy of CPA funding. And I, you know, tried to make a point that it's like they're equal. You know, whether you can go inside or not is irrelevant. It's all about the public view. The work is on the exterior. You know, there's Actually, questions. Jan, that they just um, think it's it is interesting, a, Robin. Sorry. <laughs> well, that's okay. And I just think it's a really, I think it's a really hard concept. And, and, a, and, and it's challenging to look at $100,000 for a privately held entity for people who are outside of preservation and understand that this is perfectly worthy and it, you know, it, 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 it meets all the qualifications and it's, you know, and the merits. And um, I think that's the challenge. You know, Sounds like you. Um, needs I'm going to, I'm going to ask Hetty to, to speak. She's been trying to get in. Um, Sorry. Um, I think, I think it was really interesting that the points that Robin was making about this idea of the the town of Amherst being sort of like a museum that sort of unfolds as you drive or walk around it is an argument that Jan actually made in, in the context of the Amherst Writers' Walk, where she talked about how, you know, this is, this is such an important kind of work to do because it's not happening in a history book. It's happening in material reality around you. And it's sort of one way to kind of offer public history for want of a better word um you know on view and um you know when i think about that that drive into the town from from the east village um you know the the jca building <laughs> um with its beautiful spire and the um conkley stevens house you know and the hills house they're they're all incredibly important in terms of why people you know are attracted to Amherst. Um, so I, it's just that it's, as you say, Robin, it's 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 sort of ephemeral. It's hard for them to really kind of get it in the same way that you can get, you know, doing the track by the high school, um, which which I, I get that. I mean, I think if yeah. I was a parent in town, um, you know, and I did have kids who were really sporty, you know, that that would be that would be hard. Um, you know, there's only so much money. I hate that pie, though. You know, the pie comes out and it can only be cut in so many place, ways and it can't go any further. You know, um, that that's not I don't think that's how this works. I just don't I actually don't think I understand the sort of mechanism well enough, you know, to maybe turn turn the opinion around. Um, I mean, it doesn't sound completely hopeless because isn't there another meeting where this will be reviewed again? I, I just, we just yeah. need to, to be ready, I suppose. Yeah, and maybe have some true. other people who could could speak to, to speak to this. Um, maybe make the economic argument that I was making at the bylaw meeting with the planning group that it, it's economically valuable to the town to have yeah. an attractive historic street view because I, I, yeah, I definitely spoke to that in my comments and good uh, yeah so one I, I want to go sort of go back to the beginning to I was kind of saving this in in case it became completely irrelevant or we ran out of time but um <laughs> Robin you mentioned um you know being un a little unnerved by this the size of the projects and the lack of um, sort of stringency around how they are estimated and brought in and sort of qualifications around workmanship. It's in, I think it's incredibly difficult to get three bids on a small project by qualified tradespeople. I think that's going to be kind of unrealistic. Um, I mean, there, there, you know, it, it, and it kind of depends on the, on the building climate or the construction climate, because we had this project, you know, more than a million dollars, and there are some people who just didn't want to bid on it, right. or who who bid it way up so that you know we wouldn't come back to them. Well, so the, I, I mean, can I? I just want to interject really quickly. When I say three bids, and in my experience in community development, it's the attempt to get three bids. <laughs> it's an attempt, you know, to 
that that you know for our contractors there or, or you know our projects there if you know if we put we put out we put in an out an announcement to 10 contractors and then if only one of them showed up, we took the one bid. But to have a homeowner call three contractors, is that not something that we can expect? I don't I don't think so. I mean, I don't think I don't think a homeowner could do that in in like the climate of the last year. Okay. They would get they like wouldn't get called, to make a phone call. But that would be that would be the um, that would be the attempt. You make a phone call, you don't get called back. You just put that in your application. I just, yeah, okay. I, I think it would actually be, I think it, I think it would be better for them to get the qualifications of the, the firm from what, from whom they've received the bid. Okay. Um, and, and that that gets to be part of the review. Like, okay. um, like the bidder could be, you know, can't you find, can't you find somebody who knows how to do this work? Especially when Secretary of the Interior Standards are involved. So I don't know. It may be a, a, a thing that's similar to, you know, the, the local restriction has a certain set of criteria and the, and the larger permanent restriction has a different, something different. Anyway. That's just, I'm sorry, that's that's three whole cents, not just two, three. <laughs> um, well, are we ready to leave this and perhaps to leave the entire meeting? Our, we have uh, the next meeting date. Yeah. Um, Is it March 16th? 16th? Yeah. That's and right. what do we yeah. have in April so we can plan ahead? Because I don't have one down for April. Uh, um, I may, I believe I have a conflict on the 16th. So if. In March? In March. Oh, oh wait can... a minute. No, I don't. Oh, good. Or maybe, all right. Well, if it turns out that I do, um, I'll be in touch with you, Jan. I bet you will. Mm -hmm. I'm not opposed to moving the one on the 16th. Um, I, I won't technically be in California, but I'll be working at my uh, partner's parents' house. <laughs> but uh, I'm 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 planning to work that day. And if anything, I'll actually the meeting will be at 3:30 for me. It might be nice. But <laughs> um, what day are we talking about? Uh, March 16th. Wednesday. Oh, Wednesday, March 16th. March. Okay. But I'm happy to keep it on the books for now. Um, but was um, Jan asking for an April date, or did I hear that wrong? Yeah, I just wondered if we're just going to go with the third Wednesday in April. I just kind of like to plan ahead because you know that would be great. I the have 20th. it in my calendar actually. It's the third, yeah. So okay. twenty. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I'm sorry. It wasn't March. It was that April date, April twentieth. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah. we're good for March. <laughs> But I'll be, I'll probably be done at 7.30, so I can join late, but. You know, we had a, we had a meeting on my birthday, and now you want me to run a meeting on my half birthday? <laughs> <laughs> you, you do not know how long it took me to figure out when your half, when my half birthday was. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I'm still waiting for the chocolate cake you promised me in October. <laughs> Uh, mm. <laughs> yeah. So are, are we talking about the 20th then of April? Yep. Okay. Okay. Now you all know when my half birthday is. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Shall I um, make a motion to adjourn? I second. Oh, I haven't made it yet. <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, like wait, do listen carefully, yeah. Jim. <laughs> okay. Hey, is there a motion to adjourn? There is. Oh, who's making it? I am, and Pat's oh. seconding it. <laughs> Super. All right. A second. So we have a second. There's, uh, as I've, I, I don't know whether this is true, but I, what I hear people say in meetings is that the motion to adjourn is not debatable. There. <laughs>
That's hilarious. I didn't know that. Great. Bye, Bye everybody. All right. Thank you. Bye. Good night. Good night. Good night. Take care, everyone. Good night. Mm.